Okay, let's continue. The next topic we want to review is recursion. Well, recursion is definitely a scary topic if you just started coding. And even for the student who has been coding for some time, and recursion is also a concept you don't use every day. Well, if you feel this way, that's perfectly fine. Because when I first started coding, in the first maybe two years, of doing the coding in my college years, I have never used recursion. Well, of course, well, I know how to do that if I have to do that, but I was, uh, I was trying my best to avoid using recursion in my first two years in college. Okay, well, in my argument is, well, we should, we cannot avoid using recursion in this course. So let's try to see how we can do that. Okay, well, for the recursion, uh, it's, it's well, the definition is not so hard. We have been doing the function calls from function A to function B. Well, that's okay. Well, if we are calling function A from the, the definition of function A, and then we are doing recursion. Okay, well, let's do, uh, let's see a very small example. If we have a a function definition called and this and inside we print this is recursive and then I do a and this function cal and that is we are calling the and this right inside of the definition of itself so what is going to happen so after we do this definition how about we call that only once and if we call that and this is what we will see well if you keep on printing, this is recursive. And very soon, you will see the next sign. That is recursion arrow because, well, you are doing the recursion cow inside the recursion cow inside the recursion cow. And eventually, if you're going too deep, Python will force you to stop. And otherwise, well, this recursion will eventually claim all the main memory possible on your machine. Okay, well, this is recursion and this is a bad recursion because it doesn't really do anything useful. So how do we do good recursion? Well, for a good recursion, we should have at least two components. Number one, that is the base case. The base case or base cases, they define when do we stop this recursion. Well, and then if we are not at the base case or base cases yet, and we will have a recursive steps. And the recursive step or the recursive steps will tell us what to do so that we can get closer to the base cases. And for the, for the recursive steps, there are mainly two different steps or two different styles. Well, number one, we want to reduce the problem size by one. And number two, we want to do a divide and conquer. So for 99% of the recursions, they are using either one of those two styles as the recursive steps. Okay. And number three, well, the third part is not necessary in all the recursions. In most of the recursions, probably you don't really have that. However, in some of the algorithms, like merge sort, we will use the third step. Well, I usually ca call that the aftermath of the recursive steps. Okay, well, we will see that in the merge sort. Okay, well, let's start from the uh, one very small example of about the recursion. We want to do factorials. And the definition of the factorial is, well, uh, if the current number is a zero and then n factorial, when n is zero, that is one, okay? And for the positive values, n greater than zero, and then n factorial equals one, one multiplied by two, multiplied by three, it da, 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 multiplied by n, okay? So that's the definition of factorial, okay? and say we want to create a function factorial. So now let's change it to factorial n. So factorial n is a function definition we are gonna do later, but if n is a zero, we are gonna have factorial n equals one. And otherwise, well, if n is a greater, a value greater than zero, and then factorial n is one multiplied by two multiplied by three, da da da, multiplied by n. Okay, well, for the base case, 
Well, this defined where we stop. And that is usually the smallest possible case that the problem is super easy to solve. And for our case of factorial, the factorial zero is a one. That is our one and the only one base case. Well, in the next part, that is the important part. And remember, we are taught doing a recursive step. So we are trying to add the recursion into our definition. That is, if n is a value greater than zero, and then n factorial equals n multiplied by n minus one factorial. Okay, so what's the difference? Because for this part, it seems that we are still doing the same thing. But what's the important part? We are breaking the factorial n into two parts. First part, that is n. Well, we have already known the n value. And the second part, that is the factorial n minus 1. So we are reducing the n to two parts. n, we have already known that. And factorial n minus 1, that is a smaller problem than factorial n. So that is one of the important thinking that is reduce the size of the problem by one. And we have just done that. Okay. And then well, using this thinking, and here is the definition. The definition is, well, we have a factorial n function definition. If n is small or equal to zero, we return a one. And otherwise, we are returning n multiplied by factorial n minus one. That's it. Okay. Well, a lot of times when you're when you're coding recursion, you you write it you write the code and you feel okay, my job is done. Really? Yes, your job has already been done. This is the definition of a factorial function uh, that will return you the factorial n. Okay. So let's see another example. Well, let's say we have a list and then we want to sum all the values together, and let's think about that. What is the smallest possible case that we definitely, definitely know how to solve? So if we have a really, really smallest, this smallest doesn't really require us to break it into even smaller parts. And what can it be? How about we use this one as an example? If the length of the list is a one, what is that? If the length of a list is a one, and then we only have one value in the list, and what's the sum? The sum of a one value list is the value itself, right? Okay, we are going to put that into a base case. That is, if the length is one, and then we are returning the value of the first item because that's the only item in the list. Okay, the next part, how do we do the recursive step? Well, for me, I'm doing this word, and this is not the only word, and, but I'm doing if the list is longer than one item. And then I'm holding the first value and plus the sum of all the remaining of the values. Okay, let me repeat. Well, if the length of the current list is greater than one, and then I'm using one hand to hold the first value, and then I'm gonna use the other hand to get the, the sum of all the remaining values, and then I'm gonna add them together. So that is the first item and plus a recursive cost sum list of the rest of the values. And this is a slice from one all the way to the end. Okay, and then if I want to sum this part, and this is the process. Well, I want to sum the list of the four items, one, two, three, four. And if I'm using this recursive step, I'm using one hand to hold the A, and then using the, the, the other hand to figure out the, two, the sum of the rest three values, the sum of two, three, and four. And then we have to go to a recursive step. Now we want to figure out what's the sum of the two, three, and four. And again, I'm using one hand to hold the first value, which is two. And now my job is to figure out the sum of two, the three and four. Okay, and how do we get the sum of three and four? Again, I'm using one hand to hold the value three. And then for the rest of them, 
Okay, luckily there's only one value, right? So on, on my left hand, I have three, and then on the other hand, I have four. So three plus four, I know the sum of the three and four is seven. So I'm gonna return a seven here. So I have got the sum of the three and four figured out. So I'm going to do a return to the color because now I know the sum list of the three and four. And then, well, three and four is seven, and then two plus is seven is a nine. That is the sum of the two, three, and four. Okay, well, and then I want to do one for the return to the top, and then I will have 10. Okay. Well, and here is another example. This is also an algorithm you should have already learned from the data structure. That is the binary search. So for the binary search, the thinking is different. Now we are using a different thinking. That is, we want to do a divide and conquer. Well, say, if I have a sorted list, and then I want to do a search and find a specific value. Well, what's the, what's the easiest way? The easiest way is I can do a sequential search, right? And say, well, uh, the analogy I want to use is, well, I walk into a classroom and there are a few dozen of students and I'm looking for a student, Bob. So how can I do that? I can visit student one and say, hey, are you Bob? Well, if the student says no, and then I go to the a second person and say, hey, are you Bob? Well, I can keep on asking this to all the students and there are two possible cases. Number one, if I ask the 20 students, for example, and then he told me, yes, I'm Bob. And I say, okay, I find Bob. So Bob, come with me. Okay, that's the first case. So I have already found Bob. And the second case is, if I have visited all the students, I ask this question, are you Bob? To all the students in, in this class, and eventually no one said yes. And what does that mean? This means there's no such student Bob in this classroom, right? So this is the thinking of sequential search. We are visiting all the members one by one in order to find a specific value we are searching for. Well, but for the binary search, well, remember we are starting from a sorted list. Since this list is already sorted, we can be a little bit smarter than that. Well, we have the lower bound, which is the very beginning. We have the upper bound, which is the very end. But now I want to visit the value at the middle first. If the middle value is exactly the value I'm, I'm searching for, and then, ta-da, drop down, right? Well, otherwise, if the middle value is less than the value I'm searching for, what should I do? If the middle value is less than the value I'm searching for, and then the information I have is the value I'm searching for. If it is there, it has to be from the middle to the end. Okay, so I'm only searching from the middle to the end because I'm looking for a larger value than the middle. Okay, the similar thing. If the middle value is even greater than the value I'm looking for, and then I have to search from the beginning to the middle because that is the smaller half. Okay, so that is the thinking of the binary search. And remember, we are using another strategy of the recursion, that is the divide and conquer. We are dividing the problem into two small parts, and then we will decide, do we do the search in the larger half, or we are doing the search in the smaller half? So. Every time we are cutting the problem set into two smaller problems and we only have to solve one of them. Okay, so that is the thinking of the divide and conquer. And for the code, I have uh, I have the code for you. And well, this code is a little bit tricky because even though we are doing a binary search of a list and a target, and we do have to define another helper function. So for the helper, we have the list, we have the target value, and then we also specify the search upper bound and the search lower bound. 
Okay. Well, and if the if the uh, if the uh, the lower bound is greater than the upper bound, and then we are going to return it false, saying, okay, we have already touched a invalid search space, so there's no search value we are looking for. And other than that, we have the middle value, and then we want to compare the middle value to the target. And if the target is exactly the middle value, we are returning it true. And otherwise, we decide if we want to search in the higher half or the lower half. So that is the thinking of the binary search. Okay, well, here's an example. If we have a list and then we are searching for three, and how do we do that? We have the lower bound as a zero and the upper bound and eight. So what's the middle value? The middle index should be four. And then on the middle index, we have 13. So we are looking for a three. So, well, that is three is lower than the middle value, which is 13. So what does that mean? This means if we do have the value three, it got to be in the lower half, right? So I'm going to cross out the four to eight because well, this part, this part, well, we don't need to search anymore. And then we have up, we want to update the lower, uh, well, uh, for the upper bound, we update update that from three. So now the search space becomes from index zero to index three, and then we want to do another search. And then the new middle value is on index one, and on the index one, we have the value one. However, we are looking for three. This means, well, we can cross out the index zero and one. Now we only have the lower bound to be a two, and then the upper bound to be a three. That is our new search range. And then if you want to continue, well, uh, we have to do a floor division. So now the middle index is a two and on the middle in uh, the middle index two, we have the value two. So now we have to do another round of the search. So we cross out the two and now we have a search space of only index three, right? So this is what is going to happen on the search space of from three, from index three to index three. Now we have the index three at the middle value, middle index, and the middle value on the middle index is eight. So eight is greater than the three. So what do we do? We have to search in an invalid search space now, because now the lower bound is a three. The upper bound is a two. That is an invalid search space. And if the search space is invalid, we are going to do a return false. This means there's no such value. Okay, well, here is another example and uh, consider this as a challenge for you. Well, f uh, how do you find, do a recursion to find the largest number in a list? Well, you have to, uh, you have to uh, decide a couple of things. What is a, what is the base case? Well, how about we do this way? Well, if we have a list, we hold the first element. And then for the remaining n minus 1 values, we want to find the max. So we hold one value and then for the remaining n minus 1 value, we want to find the max and we want to do a comparison. If the first value is larger than the largest one in the remaining n minus 1, this one is the largest. Otherwise, this one is the largest. Okay. So, well, this is the hint for you guys and see, well, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this problem to you and you should be able to, number one, design the algorithm and number two, you should be able to call them.